Guys, welcome to the Spotter Up Podcast, where we follow the traditional total man concept of gunfighter, writer, wild man, and monk. Boom, ladies and gentlemen, we are live. We're the Spotter Up Podcast. Uh, we follow the traditional total man concept of gunfighter, writer, wild man, monk, man of action, man of intellect, man of emotion, man of spirit. Uh, guys, what we want to do this season is we want to get more pointed. We want to get more direct. We want to get you guys more aware as far as what's going on internationally, what's going on domestically. And we need some of the best thinkers as far as how do we drive that action and how do we stay informed properly? So I had to bring on uh, uh, a fellow Matt Larson student and one of the leading thinkers on urban warfare, modern warfare, next generation warfare. Uh, guys, welcome, John Spencer. Hey, thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Hey, th thank you for coming on. I, I, I got to say this is an episode I've, I've actually been really excited about. Um, I guess it's just... Uh, you know, just working with Matt for, for so long, he's always talked about you and, 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 you know, modern warfare and kind of always preparing for the future and the next threat, um, as opposed to what we've done traditionally within the institution of, of kind of work of based off of what we know last. Um, why, why don't you, uh, give a little bit of background about yourself and, and so that way people could kind of get an insight on, on where you're coming from with this material. So, sure. So I, yeah, I just retired from the army about two years ago. I had a 25 year career. I entered as a, an enlisted guy at, at the age of 17, uh, as a private. And at one point I was in second ranger battalion with Matt. Uh, and I got my ear bit off in a fight, which we can talk about if you want. Um, and that led to, it led me down a different path, but I've always been a big fan of the warrior scholar belief, um, in, in developing your skill sets. But I progressed as an infantryman. I left 275. I took my ear bit off. Um, and it, I reached our first class and eventually, eventually went to officer candidate school, became an officer, went straight to Italy and jumped in with the 173rd into northern Iraq for, for the invasion. Had an amazing year of experience. Uh, came back, had to go back to school. And then I was a ranger instructor as a captain. Uh, and immediately deployed back into Iraq in 2008 with the 4th Infantry Division into Baghdad. And that's where I really got a much more of an experience of urban warfare and the ideal set in me about urban warfare and insurgencies and everything. Uh, I left, I came back, and I went into a program where I went to school for a while, went into the Pentagon, did my time there, um, and eventually ended up at West Point for my last assignment. Uh, and while there, I helped stand up the Modern War Institute, which is an institute just dedicated to studying what, what's going on in the world and whether we're paying attention. And I wrote an article about uh, the use of concrete in Iraq. And if anybody has ever studied or ever been to Iraq, they know that that's what we're doing a lot of times is using concrete. And the article went viral for some reason as the American population. And unfortunately, even the the American army didn't realize how much the different uses of concrete barriers in, in combat. And that just started me down the road. I also, while I was there, had great mentors of how to write. And I think it's a skill set that I had not developed at that point. You know, I, I'd, I'd worked on advancing all kinds of skill sets, everything from, you know, jujitsu to shooting to everything, but how to write and communicate ideals is powerful. And I, once I learned that I, I just became addicted and just started writing and that led to more studying to more writing. And eventually when I retired in 2018, the Institute decided that the urban warfare line of research was very important and nobody was covering it. So I have a dream job where I get to, from my home, continue to study and write, publish, and, and sometimes poke people in the eyes about, you know, the fact that urban warfare is the future and some people aren't prepared for it. So, I, I think that's that's really interesting. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm an I'm an old 82nd guy, so I, I automatically like you lost a little bit, but but so <laughs> I still <laughs> I still think pretty pretty highly. But uh, I think the let, let's talk about the concept of of urban warfare because I think even on 
as you said, like even within the American military mind, when they think warfare, they kind of think about like this army against our army. And then we kind of meet in the middle and then like my crew will gang up your crew and, and, and they don't really uh, grasp the concept. And, and I, and I don't mean that as far as like the guys who've been on the ground, but let's talk about like the people because I mean, we're drawn down from the wars and now we're getting more and more younger and uh, uh, newer soldiers, uh, Marines, airmen, sailors, and they're kind of, they don't understand the lessons, uh, uh, you know, as Americans, we have short memories. So let, let's talk about that. What is the difference between like urban warfare a, as you're talking about it or in, uh, or what, what do you think gets lost in people's mind when they hear that? Yeah, for sure. I, I spend, I do, I do a lot of presentations and one of the first slides I always show up is a slide that says urban warfare. And let's, let's talk about what we hold in our mind. Like, what do we immediately think about if we say that, you know, most, most of us ground pounders with any experience will think about you know, close quarters combat. Uh, we'll think about fighting insurgencies, fighting bad people in there. I put up this whole range of military operations, everything from total war in cities from dropping atomic bombs on cities or bombing cities into submission all the way over to, you know, humanitarian assistance missions. You know, I'm a, I'm an old infantryman. So I always want to talk about, let's talk about warfare. Let's talk about killing the bat the man on the other side uh, who has a goal of trying to kill you so if we talk about actual warfare which is fighting um, as opposed to just war we talk about warfare in urban areas people still go into it with these ideals in their mind about the environment being permissible so on you know we are the masters the u.s military at close quarters battle we create we invented most of the tactics, which most people don't understand when they carry something forward in their mind, where it originally came from. And, you know, Matt Larson was teaching us this back in the nineties about know where it all started and how it evolved to today. And are you holding on to something that you shouldn't be? So I always put up a slide of inner and clear a room because one, it's a very powerful tactic, but for some reason it's the only thing we think about in urban warfare. And that tactic came from 1970s really after the failed Munich raid of the uh, Israeli Olympics or Olympians that were taken in the, in the raid went really bad. After that, we created Delta. We created all special forces, you know, tier one type of units. And they evolved the, the ability to enter a small space, you know, close quarters and develop those inner and clear tactics. We migrated to general purpose force. But, you know, the type of urban warfare I study and the type of urban warfare I see for the last 10 years, 20 years, the in, inter and clear of room tactic, the, you know, the intelligence driven raid, which is really dependent on, you know, violence of action, surprise, speed is not what I'm seeing on the battle. And that inter and clear of room tactic has application. But the battles you're seeing today, you know, the are where insurgents contesting state power will move into urban areas because it gives them immense marked advantages against any state power, any other military. If you can get inside an urban terrain and defend it or hold it or disrupt it, you know, a modern military, it's really doesn't, isn't as prepared as you think that they are in doing it. And we saw that in all these cities where the Islamic state in Syria and Iraq took cities for short-term political games and short-term for some people meant two to three years or in some cities, they still hold, hold some ground and how hard that is to break the, the mindset of urban warfare is only about, you know, I know the house I want to attack and how to attack it. When you talk about a complete city of 800,000 people, more reminiscent of world war two, there are different tactics, different lessons, um, that you have to utilize and even different tools that are gone in our inventory that are needed today, more so than the high speed stuff that we have today. Um, if you talk about, you know, clearing a block, I'm not going to enter and clear every room in a block. I need high explosives. I need flamethrowers. I need ability to see inside buildings. I need a lot more than I have today. So I do a lot of talks on urban warfare, either about, attacking cities because that's been a really huge in the last 10 years or about defending cities 
uh, you know, the U.S. military and most modern militaries are, are based in what's called maneuver warfare, which I, I know, John, you want to talk about fourth generation warfare. I mean, third generation warfare was more was really the creation of maneuver warfare tactics where you outmaneuver the enemy um, wherever he's trying to create a strong point. You know, as seen in World War Two with the storm two or War One, really storm troop tactics, you know, going around defensive trenches. Um, that's really hard to do in a city. Uh, so you see this evolution of fourth generation warfare. I show it, this evolution of what's called siege warfare. Um, siege warfare tactics in cities, which is really just defending. But as we've also gotten out of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, yes, I know we still have a little bit of people there, but most of the big army, big Marine, you know, big organizations are shifted to this what called great power competition. And there's a bunch of fallacies in that conversation. Uh, but I have been contacted about people with great interest of, well, how do you defend urban terrain? Because we just, we as the U.S. militaries, as a maneuver warfare attacker, don't usually think about stopping and defending urban terrain. But there's no reason why we shouldn't, because if you look at the evolution, what we call the evolution of the character of warfare, if you think it won't happen in a city, then you, I strongly believe people are just really naive. So, so you're bringing up a lot of really interesting points to me. Um, the first thing you talked about was the immense politically ga political gain for the uh, for the opposition. Um, but I, th I think, uh, well, maybe uh, and uh, maybe it might be going lost in translation for some folks that it, it's actually working both ways, right? Like every advantage on the field, it actually works in either direction. It just depends on uh, who who's exploiting it. So let's talk about let's talk about that the political gain. And specifically, let, let's talk about the media, because one thing I noticed from uh, my, my limited time in, in Iraq was that what the insurgents were actually doing is we had uh, we had Ugandans guarding the perimeter and we had just replaced replaced the Americans with Ugandans. And when we replaced the, the Americans with Ugandans, all of a sudden the perimeter attacks had stopped. And it was very clear to me that they were doing things for the sake of the propaganda value. So can you talk about that as far as like the, the media, the political gain and, and how the, how the propaganda piece plays into urban warfare? Oh uh, yeah. Oh, that's a huge topic. Um, and I don't want to go cliche with you, know, all the other people's big sayings, you know, my world is always closet and you know, a few people have read it, but everybody quotes it. Yeah. But I mean, all war is political in nature. Uh, if not, you they're just you're killing people that just want to have fun playing playing warfare most warfare in some way has a political goal and political goals are about influence so in, who are you trying to influence and are you trying to influence the immediate government are you trying to influence the international community are you trying to influence the population of the enemy you're actually fighting so yeah most of our adversaries in the you know, last 20 years have not been state. They may be state sponsored, but they haven't been states. So you know, they rely on the ability to influence through information warfare. And that's not to say states don't do that too, because we do, but with the advancement of telecommunications, yes. And this is where we always are going to be hindered is in the media ability to broadcast an attack to broadcast a message or what actually happened in an attack became, it's always been important. And, and you know, I, I live around a lot of historians in my work and I'll point out, you know, how, how it was important during the Roman times, you know, what, whatever. But if I can videotape and live, I can even do a Facebook live of an attack or, you know, whatever I can influence millions of people. And that's, that's warfare you could narrow it down to that that's information warfare, but it, it's, it's, it's a part of this whole thing. Um, and most of these adversaries we're talking about who are contesting state control, even if there's multiple organizations in that state trying to help the state stand up, whether it's a legitimate state or not, um, they're going to use every advantage. And that's what's called asymmetric warfare. No dummy in the world is going to take anybody on in a fair fight, right? right. We all, we know that, right? So the use of propaganda, the use of information 
advantage, it, they see it as a just giant advantage because they know how weak we are in terms of our population's belief in a mission. You know, look to Black Hawk Down and the immediate removal of troops. Look to the Battle of Fallujah One, which is one I always use in my arguments for urban warfare. If, if nobody remembers, you know, in the first battle of Fallujah, four American contractors, Blackwater, uh, private military contractors were, were ambushed and killed. It was videotaped. Uh, they were hung from a bridge. Um, the whole country was actually exploding, but that one event made national news. And the U S government said to the, to the Marines on the ground, you will respond and move into the city. Now, um, some people know the story that the Marine Corps uh, general officer said, no, I, I don't think that's a good idea. We, sh we should not do that. And again, we're military. We follow orders in all wars politics. And the American government, the American population wanted a response immediately. So within a few days, they, they entered the city uh, in April of 2004. And within four days, they were ordered to stop. And the reason they were ordered to stop is because the bad people inside the city had already gotten ahead of the information game and had invited outside media into the city. And it was Al Jazeera set up in the hospital videotaping civilian deaths, which unfortunately are always going to happen. Um, but if you don't get ahead of the, the message, they, they broadcast civilian deaths to the international community. And within four days of the fighting starting inside the battle of Fallujah, it was called off because the entire Iraqi government was threatening to disband. The British government was threatening to walk away from the alliance. It's the biggest example I have of the importance of media controlling the, the narrative, which is just one small component, but a very big component today. And as we're seeing fighting, you know, most people have seen the kill TV live footage that's happening in Azerbaijan and Armenia today. And, and then, you know, immediate tweets about how many tanks they took out, how many, um, that's the reality of today's warfare. And I think even the, the warfare that you and I experienced was only a taste of it where in the future you can see real time footage, which is just an evolution of, you know, Vietnam war watching the nightly news and seeing battles but with no filter um, immediately from the enemy side where we always put some, we always want to filter it in some way, put context behind it that, that needs to happen. But you might as well. And some people have predicted this, that future of the war warfare in the future will be more like playing an NFL game in a, in a stadium filled with attendance. You, they're always going to be somebody watching what the bad guy does is they, as of right now, I think this is still evolving too. It just has, has people who are assigned to be the media collectors. It, it happened to me in 2008 when I, and in Iraq, my, the little JSS I had outside of Cyrus city was attacked with uh, a giant bomb, the dumpster bomb called IRAMS, uh, improvised rocket system munitions. And before I was ever even able to get on the ground, Hezbollah had put up a video of the attack. For propaganda purpose showing a successful attack against the strong mighty military it, it's and matt and, and you know has all these you know big conversations and i have them too it, it's it's when you believe you're the big tough guy and you have no weakness that the your opponent is always thinking about your weaknesses your casualty aversion for a western military name the military not just the us is huge a huge weakness of ours um, you know, one death is, 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 is huge. Um, the information campaign and then the immediate release of it to get ahead of, uh, whether it's, you call it fake news or whatever it, it's, you got there first. Right. And, and that, that's kind of the, the competition. I mean, it, it's, it's funny, like the, the football stadium is such an uh, appropriate analogy because it, it's not just the idea of having all these civilians involved or these uh, these bystanders, but also the the fact that you have to move in increments. Uh, and, and I think that's something that people, um, especially in the population, like they want these microwave oven responses like we want it now. We want the solution now. And it's just like 
they don't understand like uh you have to fight these battles like block by block and even even sometimes room by room i mean is, is that fair to say yeah absolutely i mean you, you, most warrior scholars know that i mean you're you'll never win a fight by bombing somebody you have to physically get in there and take something away from him you either take his life or you take his land and there are a few military officers i general especially like general rainey um who understand that concept and believe it so that's where you get against the the kind of the thought that in the future wars we fought by robots you know which is this hope of casualty aversion no if you want to defeat somebody you have to either take his life or take his land and you do that like you said inch by inch if i want to take a your urban space which they would this is why or why you know, any fight game if you expose an easy win then you're going to go to that move even if it's your favorite move you're going to keep doing that move until somebody defeats it that's what we've seen in urban warfare it wasn't the the chosen battleground of the past but because of political constraints the new ways of warfare you know the the concerns of the population and the less collateral damage less civilian damage the new laws of armed conflict the 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 preferred move of any adversary will be urban terrain because it's going to work not in a geopolitical sense you're not going to win a war by but that's not the goal of all of our adversaries and that's the whole point of this whole fourth generation warfare is that you know, the likelihood of a nation state versus nation state having this big tank battle or you know a big sea battle with china it, it might be a very dangerous and you can never say never and nobody's good at predicting future war but the warfare going on today all across the world is is non-state actors pulling armies into the moves that are ad an advantage to them which is in dense urban areas filled with civilians so that they can take away your, your power moves so you, you brought up uh, another thing that that um i don't think i've ever read in an army manual you talked about siege warfare oh yeah so so talk talk to us a little bit about what that means uh i mean if you know i i think of sieges and i think about kind of the old english i i guess we can call that what is that that first or second generation uh type warfare so, um I, but in any case i i would like to actually just elaborate on what does that mean siege warfare yeah so i i'm loose with the term I mean, all these things have you know, these crazy definitions and you know all these big heads will argue against it siege warfare is like what it what it sounds like it's it's just think about castles you know in yeah especially in first generation warfare um you want to protect your city build an amazing defensive belt around it and defend inside of it because in order to attack it uh it there's so and we saw this during the explosion of siege warfare castles and you know from ancient times all the way up till the 17th 18th century where again this is you know, all warfare is about ace you know advantage versus disadvantage action versus counter action so during that time it was a huge advantage for you to get inside of a castle get up on the walls and just blow the hell out of anybody coming at you um and then there were there's you know age of siege the evolution of siege warfare you know went to siege warfare busting technologies um and it wasn't really until the invention of black powder and especially artillery where i could stand back from your siege your castle walls or whatever and i could blow it apart and it no longer was good for you because once i get inside your defensive belt you're done for well as you know as warfare evolved um in the evolution of line tactics which is uh first generation warfare really line tactics you know man on man swords and as the evolution of black powder rifles and everything the really armies were invented after siege warfare when instead of sitting hold tight inside of your castle you sent an army forward of your castle to go attack the other army before they got to you um so you fast forward to world war one you have trench warfare and we call that positional warfare which is still a an offset of siege warfare right you're staying in one place 
waiting for somebody to attack your defense and hopefully making them pay so much so that you attrit them. Another term, attritional warfare. And then after really then World War II, I know this is long, but it, it all matters and it, it will go back to siege warfare. You know, at the end of World War I, you know, the, the invention of the tank, the airplane, uh, stormtroop tactics. And as we saw in the evolution into World War II, the maneuver warfare what became the third generation where I could no longer, I'm going to attack you. I'm not going to attack you inside your castle. I'm not going to attack you on your trench line. I'm not going to uh, try to hit your hardest points. I'm just going to outmaneuver you. I'm going to make a, a penetration into your defenses and then flow into you and overwhelm you from the side, from the back. And, and it isn't until you take some army guy and you really pick apart his mind and saying, that's all you know today is maneuver warfare. You know, fire maneuver, maneuver warfare. Siege warfare is positional warfare. It means I'm going to hold in one spot and I'm going to defend. And if you want to take my ground, you want to take my life, you want to take my land, you better figure out a way to do that. That's why I say siege warfare is back because you just have, without the castle walls, you still have people going within cities because of the physical nature of the terrain and holding the ground and saying, come get me. You're not going to outmaneuver them in that terrain. Uh, even when you try maneuver warfare um, with advanced technologies in there, it's going to go very badly for you. You'll still win. You'll pay a heavy price. And usually what they're, what I, we're seeing is that they're going to make you pay such a heavy price that it becomes almost questionable to continue the mission. So it, that's where Fluja 1 comes into mind or the some of these battles against an Islamic State. Like, is it worth it to destroy a city to save it? But – that's why siege warfare and positional warfare is back is because it's the advancements of I can kill you hundreds of miles away with hypersonic missiles, with artillery, all that. I mean, there's no dummy that's going to stand out in the open. And that's what we saw. What, again, what we're seeing in Azerbaijan and Armenia today, like if I can see a tank from the sky, I can kill it. It's pretty easy. Um, if I can see a tank inside of a city, I could probably kill it, but am I willing to pay the price of destroying, you know, a couple, couple blocks in order to do it, uh, or you know, a couple hundred civilians when I do it? And you, know, we don't want to think about that, and we want this assumption that that's that's not going to be the case. But siege warfare, positional warfare is back, and if it is, if if I'm right, how prepared are we as, as in you know, a military as in the army or any other military to? remember the lessons of siege warfare and what it took to make that go away. You know, your siege warfare went away for a reason. Trench warfare went away for a reason. Uh, and now it's back because maneuver warfare is so powerful, but I'm you no, know, no dummy is going to fight you the way you want to fight them. Yeah. It's funny too. I mean, I, I'm, I'm hearing Matt's voice in my head right now. He yeah. is like, like we we don't send guys into a building because we can shoot everybody in there like we send cruise missiles or something so um i, th I think the civilian piece is, is very important um that especially the way you're breaking it down it's like I, i'd never really heard it broken down that way and i, I also think it's important as far as and and i I'd like to move into the, the the fourth generation uh warfare conversation a little bit as far as how what we do as far as like you know, destroying the city to save it, how that plays a role in creating new enemies for us. I mean, the other thing that is, all, I mean, well, I guess it never really left in, in places like Afghanistan, where before the state-sponsored armies, we had wars that were local and tribal. Can, can you um, elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so the, um, you know, what is war? If you ask you all different guests, and I do it on my podcast show and we're whole everybody holds something in their mind um fourth generation warfare was you know just a group of academics that said you nation state on nation state wars are least likely future of warfare it's it's more political warfare because of the unraveling of control of the world after world war ii and especially after the fall of the soviet union the fall of the british empire as now you have these huge swaths of the world that are contested. They're not controlled with some major state power that, that, that worked. So 
you name the country where there's combat going on and you can really trace it to this loss of state power because there's always a, a, a disenfranchised group of people that want to um, change their situation. Uh, sometimes that's terrorists and this all fits into the fourth generation warfare since it's all that by definition, that means a non-state actor fighting against a state actor. Um, so that's the warfare that we've seen. Even if you argue how we started the war in Afghanistan, um, your know, Afghanistan just happens to be the, you know, the, the, the graveyard in, of empires because there's never been a real state. Um, and, and that's a long conversation, but it, even in these contested pieces of the ground, then you have different factions that, that are become powerful enough to either overthrow the government and become their own government or just live in this constant state of, I'm just going to threaten the government. I'm going to own different spheres of influence across this entire country. And you can say you own the country in your city, in your high tower, but we all know who owns the land and it's all about power. Uh, all warfare is about power really, but the fourth generation is really trying to hit hard about it's not going to be state on state. It's, every model that we have in order to address war is, is more of a state on state mindset. So then you talk about, well, if it's not a state on state, so it's all this non-state stuff, right? So it's insurgencies, revolutions, uh, terrorist groups that become insurgencies uh, or that try to attempt a revolution in certain parts of the world. It's just the natural day to day state of warfare. Um, the problem is when you have somebody like the U S who's has natural interests all around the globe and we insert ourselves, but we insert ourselves with a state on state mindset, or we try to build a country up like Afghanistan or Iraq and build them an army who's ready to fight another army. But that's not the war they fight on a day to day basis. You know, I, I think I personally, and I have said it that, you know, the Iraqi military who had to fight ISIS after we left was completely unprepared because they, we built them in our image. We're built to fight another military. We're not built to fight an insurgency, no matter what we, the changes we did in Iraq or in Afghanistan. So we, I got a question about that. I mean, it, there, there's also something, uh, for me, I, I think the having a, a culture, I think one of the things that we do as a, Americans is that we try to project our culture onto people. What, what do you think as far as um, our culture and how we approach other cultures um, or trying to integrate other cultures in with uh, the way we conduct warfare? I mean, I mean, right now we're, we're, we're missing the mark and, and I think uh, that's probably an understatement, but uh, let, let's, can you elaborate on that as far as how we have tried to train these armies uh, to conduct war and how their cultures may or may not be um, congruent with, with what we're trying to do? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you said it, I can reinforce it, but we have a, you know, we grow up with a mindset of all these cultural ideals in our mind and uh, um, an ethical code, a moral code, um, uh, and we were strict followers of the laws of armed conflict. Uh, and then when we, we project that onto another culture, that's it's completely foreign from the, not only from the day they were born, but to their religious beliefs, to their ethical, to their complete history of their people. It's, it literally is insanity um, because we'll keep trying it and we'll keep doing it. Um, and I, you know, I can point to all kinds of examples. I mean, you and I both can. Everything from the simple basics of don't, you know, don't steal stuff or you know, all this stuff. <laughs> um, but the history of doing this, right? The history of of trying to help others fight for themselves. Um, if you look back at you, know, how the British did it, how how the French army did it, you know, all these different people who have arguably some of these. We always, we always have a mindset too. We want to win. Yeah. And it just, we, the, so in some of these environments, the, there is no winning. Um, and fighting is just going to continue. And it's always been there. Mm -hmm. And the ideal that we have as a Western 
American people that we're going to go in there and fix it. I can fix this. I can, yes, I can fix this. I can, <laughs> you know, I can, oh, you know, everything from building, you know, building an army is a nice place to, to refine it down. But the whole reason you're there, we say we're there is to kill bad guys and to make it so that we can leave and the place is still this ideal of a Western state that we have in our mind, but it's never been that. Don't get me started about Afghanistan. Uh, the, the fact that we thought we could create a Western democratic state over there with a military that is viewed as legitimate as ours across the entire country. It's, it's just insanity and lacks any history um, but we're good soldiers and we'll do what we're told. We'll keep trying. So um, let's, uh, man, that, that, that's, it, it's painful to hear, even though I, I, I kind of knew the answer, but it was, it's still like no less painful, but it, it's like, man, are, are we going into this kind of like a, a battered spouse? Like that is like, man, I can, I can totally fix this guy, even though he hits me, like I can totally fix him. It's just like, you cannot change the way this person is and, yeah. and you cannot project this idea. I mean, even the idea of nationalism, I mean, hell, I mean, Afghans, they, they don't even like dogs. Like, what kind of people don't like dogs? You know, like, yeah. That's weird. And, um, and then, we don't, we don't like corruption. Like, right. But in a lot of these places in the entire, you know, entire, not just Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, corruption isn't corruption. It's the way of the, the way they do business. Everybody gets their cut. Yeah. I mean, the insanity of Afghanistan is that it's still, despite the billions of dollars that we've spent on it and the, you know, the lives that we've spared, it's still ranked as like in the, the bottom of the world as the most corrupt nation on the planet. Yeah. And, it, but we want to fix that. So, so I actually have a, have a good story too about, uh, about Iraq. Uh, my, my first day there, we get this uh, intelligence brief and they were talking to us and it, it was like a, a British Sergeant major. And you could tell he was just fed up with the place. And, and he was just like, yeah, uh, so this is what happened. He gave, like, we had paid, um, I guess we bought, like, a fleet of new vehicles for the local Iraqi police. And they like, yeah, they did the handshake bit, and they said this, and, and waved us, gave us a slap on the ass, goodbye. And next day, he had them stripped of all police markings and gave the cars away to as gifts to his friends. So, like, <laughs> that, those are the type of people we're dealing with. Um, let, let's, um, let's get a little bit closer to home, because I think, a lot of people may see these examples and kind of think about it as like, oh, well, that's just Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think a, a really great example as far as a, a domestic situation for us uh, where where fourth generation is alive and well, it would be like the, the situation where they the media tw twists what happens, these, these use of force incidents with cops. And then you had you know, these autonomous zones being stand up like Chaz. So can, can you, can you talk about that of like what lessons that police officers can learn from, from the, the urban warfare Institute and, and fourth generation warfare? Yeah. So yeah, it's really hard to transpose fourth generation warfare on the United States. Uh, a lot of people, you know, it's, it's all terminology and, and we can still talk about political warfare. Um, and sure. We get and, and maintain power. Yeah. I mean, Russian, what they call Russian new age warfare, what, what Russia showcased to the world in Crimea and in the, in the fights in Ukraine is, is more symptomatic of what we saw in the United States where what happens on the ground is very important. And, and what could be, what is told about what happened on the ground is so important. And I think, in domestic policing, in domestic situations, uh, the con the control of the narrative becomes so important. Despite you know, good fighters on the ground doing everything in their power to do the right thing, somebody takes that bit of information and turns it. That is new age warfare, um, and it's information warfare. Uh, and it, it's with there's so many different facets of our new domestic um, culture of how you sway bigger and bigger groups of people into creating a new reality. Um, so much so that you, like you said, Chad, which was ridiculous 
Um, because unlike other places in the world, the United States systems are very strong. Um, you know, I've had to combat this about, even if it's, you know, a white nationalist group um, making plans to overthrow our government, um, there are enough redundancies and enough good shepherds and in the United States that I think all that stuff is really just fiction. But what isn't fiction is this ability to control narratives on a scale un unlike anything we've ever seen in history. And that's where other people can get involved. And this is the warfare that is not new, but where you have an outside organization who wants to help influence the the narratives using social media using whatever it is and that, or actually putting agitators into the crowds which we've seen um, foreign agitators into the crowd who can then turn a crowd into something violent you know and that's the crowd mentality which is its own school of uh academics on how you can take a group of people to just and then turn them violent um, with a few agitators you know, exposing that is a major part of the countermeasures. Um, preventing the dumb private scenario is also always part of the countermeasures. You know, the one, the one guy who makes the one mistake that gets that then becomes the most prominent storyline, despite the two hundred men and protectors that are there on the ground doing the right thing. Uh, I think that the only way you combat that, and this is we see it in warfare, but we're seeing it today in our police. National Guard. Um, and, and the only way you combat that is with being prepared to show the counter narrative just as fast as the the you, the Russians have a term for it. But you, this 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 ability to create chaos and Russia has really coined, but China too. In this new new age warfare, has really coined tactics to do this to destabilize. They're not trying to do anything except destabilize areas. Um, I, I agree that we should stamp it out uh, like in, in Chad, that should never have happened. We should never let somebody in the United States take public and private land and call it theirs. I mean, that's called crime and, and we usually have a good way to combat that. But unlike before, when you're stopping crime, you also have to have a huge, almost army of people telling the story immediately, not after it's been, you, you, you know, from the army, we, we, it, it usually has to go through all these different levels. We have to invest in storytellers, invest in real time narratives is the only way you're going to combat the chaos that can be created because of the different organizations we have in our, with even within our States, but Russia's really gotten good at this and they showcased in the Ukraine, and this is what we call hybrid warfare, the, the, you know, the combination of unconventional proxy and then later followed up by conventional forces, complete destabilization of an entire country or a city um, with very minimum resources. I don't know if I answered your question, John. No, no, no. That, that, that's um... – that, that's good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up. I got a, a question I want to follow up with. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the part of the show where we have to do what we need to do to uh, pay, pay the bills, keep the lights on. So please, if you guys can sit tight from a message from our sponsor. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, that was our sponsor, Virtus Outdoor Group. They built gear for the extreme athlete that's available in 32 countries wa- worldwide. If you visit vogstore.com, that is V-O-G store.com, make sure you guys pick up some apparel. Guys, it's some of the best I've ever used. It's technical, it's functional, and it makes you look good. So, guys, please visit bogstore.com. And I want to take this opportunity to remind you guys that the views and opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the original authors and contributors. The views and opinions do not necessarily represent those of Spotter Up Magazine, the administrator staff, and or any or all contributors. That being said, uh, John, I I think the follow-up question I have for you now is what lessons do you think that a a, a, uh, a soldier on the ground or a Marine on the ground can learn as far as not creating new enemies in, in this kind of new age warfare where they are essentially, they have to kind of fall on the sword, right? As far as the, 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 the uh, strategy not being in line with what, what is the need of the, of the situation. What do you think is, is some lessons they could learn from being a cop or, or let's say for, the next generation warfare, what do you think is something they can draw on from the last 20 years? Yeah, yeah great question. Uh, there's a lot. Um, I mean, the, we've seen, and like you, you talked about the different cultural mindsets and the only way you prevent um, creating new enemies is to understand the environment you're in. So just like we, you know, and I fought this even as a, in Iraq as a company commander, getting younger soldiers to, especially um, where the higher ups will, will, will use the words but they're not the one entering rooms and um, having to separate bad guys versus good guys but how to communicate to your soldiers in different parts of the world that the actions they take will will create more enemies if they don't understand h- how their actions are being viewed by the people's houses they're entering or if somebody's videotaping it, that's a really hard thing to ask people to do. And we even struggle here with our, in our police forces, um, 99.9% understand it. But the one idiot who doesn't is the one that has the strategic effect. And that's kind of been around for a while, right? They just call it the strategic corporal, um, where a single d- guy's actions um, can create the strategic effects. Whether you're talking about the dumbasses who tortured people in Abu Ghraib, or you're talking about the person who burned the Quran and, and didn't realize there were Korans in the fire that he was burning. Um, and somebody else took a video of it. Uh, how do you get people from not doing dumb things? That's one of the lessons that we've learned and we have to take forward is while we're drilling and we want people to be the, the best killers in the world, which we are is also not creating new enemies by understanding every environment how they're being how the way they're presenting themselves the actions they're taking are being presented you can try to do reverse psychology and and, you talk to people about how would you feel if somebody entered your house um kicked in your door and and offended within your cultural aspects everybody that you've ever known um i'm a big believer in historical examples and in storytelling and how do you change a person's mindset you, you, you know you're not, you're not gonna change everybody you could still have the one idiot who's literally like a serial killer um or or a rape you just don't know it uh so you can either try to change his mind or at least um put in the safety safety guards to somebody's going to stop that person in the midst of it and those are some of the lessons that we've learned i think the the analogy of the the football field is one we must learn that somebody is always watching and, and you and I have been out there. That's not always, that's not been always the case. You know, there's a, we give our soldiers and our police, even in the United States, in crazy amounts of autonomy. And that's, and we have to for the mission and the trust that's there. Uh, I think in the future that, and we're seeing that with your body cams and everything that, that that's being lessened. It's just a, the new way that we'll have to move forward. I, I think that, in the near future, we'll see body cams on soldiers. We'll see live footage of, uh, of action. And we started to see that in the last wars. Um, and, and that, sh- that might help in people uh, understanding that they're, they're always being watched, but how to translate that into 
how it could be viewed is really hard, right? Not just if somebody saw a video camera of this, but like we were talking about that cross cultural thing. If I, if I do this one thing, I just took that guy who's 14 or you know, this kid and I turned him into somebody who hates us yeah, and who just joins the, the joins the population of people fighting Matt. And that's why I, I'm not a big believer in fighting the Taliban. The, the, the Taliban are the people. Yeah. Um, th there's going to have to be a new order established. And so, so I got a question on that as far as the, the autonomy goes, because one thing we did learn from when we put all these body cams on cops is that they were doing the right thing mostly. And in fact, a lot of times they, they exercise their judgment. It actually, it actually took a lot of power away from them because for instance, let's say you're doing something stupid and I, I give you like a little, a little Tommy stop and like, Hey, you know, what's going on? What are you doing? And like, you know what? Hey, just go home. Like we, we took that power away from them and now we've made it to where they have to bring the full force of the state because they're being recorded. And, um, so we kind of push them into a position where they have to do the thing that is going to actually create a new enemy for us. Um, what do you think as far as the autonomy goes? Uh, I mean, you're, 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 a, you're a, com a company commander. You retired as an, as an officer, you were also enlisted for, for so many years. So, uh, balancing that act of where soldiers, you, you trust your soldiers to make the good decisions, but you still have to kind of, and I'll keep them on a leash for, for lack of a better word. Like how, how is it that we balance those two to where we can actually affect the mission in a positive direction? Yeah. I think it's a lot easier in the military because then police, uh, although it, it's still possible in the police about weeding out the, the turds, um, in the military, and I, you know, just from my own context, the way we, so we, we have to accept autonomy and there's all these buzzwords about doing that. Um, but especially in urban warfare where it breaks down to very small teams being cut off though, we, especially Western cultures want control. We not only want control of the narrative, we want control of individual actions. Luckily we have a system where you're not going to, there, there should be, you know, a battle buddy to your left or right. And, and there's lots of research that shows just the presence of somebody else there can control human behavior. Um, and I think that's one of the keys to autonomy is that usually there is a safeguard there with a really experienced non-commissioned officer who, who understands it. I mean, there are cases where they have actually been the problem. I um, mean, the, the bad influencer, but there's all these safeguards that get you there um, where if you put four, uh, which unfortunately, if, you, if you've ever read the book called uh, Black Hearts. So if you put four privates who are you know 18 to 20 in a, in a severe state of autonomy with lethal weapons um, and add in drugs and alcohol, which reduce, you know, reasoning capacity, you, it's going to lead to bad things. I don't care what scenario you give me of how good those people are. <laughs> that's going to lead to a really bad situation because there's none of these safeguards that are a part of these our organizations who authorize lethal force. So we've been given the trust to execute lethal force when required, but we also, we have these ethical, these standards of, of how that's controlled more autonomy, less control, but that doesn't mean that it's, I mean, I like, so the body cam thing, because it, like you said, it, it go, it's a two edged sword. Yeah. It, it's not only reporting, you know, it's not a control mechanism. It's also a counter narrative and that's the beauty of it. And I love when the police or military can combat a story immediately with live footage. Like, okay, right, here it is. Do you tell me what you think he, he should have done in this yeah. situation? The problem is when we still try to control that, right? So that's the speed of the battlefield but it's all about these control mechanisms. Autonomy means less control. So you need high, a more highly specialized individual, the more autonomy they can have, the more trust they can have in the police forces. That's where it gets really hard. As you and I both know is that some police forces just don't have the budget um, to highly specialize one individual uh, or they don't even have the, 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 
the body of recruits to then weed out in because not hey no not everybody gets a prize here buddy uh, you're not all cut out for it yeah. so how do you weed you know you have to have this giant um population of people that you can weed out and create and, and test and put under stress and that's where we saw all, all of our problems in the military you know all these some of these major problems i, I talked about abu Ghraib and all this but it, it's all systemic of you know, a nation asking for a bigger military than they can create with all these controls that we have input because with without all these cutting, without drilling people, you create you 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 let in cowards, you let in criminals who then when they're put in these situations of extreme autonomy with lethal force authorization, it leads to really bad things. And we should know like, well, we should have expected that um, as we're letting in you know, people with felony convictions, people with drug convictions, you know, all these, and don't get, don't get Matt Larson started about Jessica Lynch. Um, but yeah. <laughs> you've probably heard the stories, but that's a systemic of a profession who has to let in all these, you know, other individuals and not everybody can have the warrior mindset. And that's a problem uh, because it will lead to disaster. And now as a new evolution of warfare, it's, I'm going to take advantage and like, but that's the problem is that us won't, we don't fight that same way. So if, if we see the, you know, the other side doing that, we won't be as quick to, to highlight it internationally. Um, what, what's being done. You know, you know, one of the things too, I hate, uh, as far as, um, I mean, I, I feel like right now we're making some very valid comparisons between law enforcement, military operations, how they how they should function, the lessons they can learn from each other. But one of the things I really, really hate uh, as far as comparison, when they say this militarization of police, that they there there there's all kinds of like implications there, like like we're just busting and down buildings and just spray and pray with no regard to to civilian casualty um i think in a lot of situations even like the 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 uh use of force uh rules of engagement are so so strict i mean look we had a blockbuster movie happen uh and a and along with you know that was built on a massive uh you know uh, um let's say compromise of, of a mission that came from those rules of engagement with lone survivor right and and look how many lives that caused i right? look how many lives we're willing to sacrifice to comply with the rules of engagement and um like I, i've never read black hearts I, I i'm interested oh, in now but i i have read um, ordinary men and i, I think that's actually a, a another very uh, appropriate comparison as far as uh lessons learned for military and law enforcement uh and one of the things I, I really want to get into you uh, or really get get from you into this is uh, how how do we prepare for this? Right. Let's say uh, that, that you're you're General John Spencer and you have complete control and you decide how I want to drive the force to be prepared for the next war and yeah. both dom well, but domestic foreign threats. How do you prepare that? What do you do differently? And what as opposed to what's being done right now? Yeah. Well, one, that's, that's highly unlikely of a situation, but, um, <laughs> and unfortunately we're in a really bad situation as we move into this interwar period. If you ever, if you watch the media about the military, as they, they, they think they, we believe we're in this interwar period, um, a, almost peacetime army. So to keep people focused on the demands of the current, what I view as the current warfare is really hard domestically it's a lot easier to argue. Um, so if I can make changes, of course the changes would be creating more and more specialized warriors. So that takes time. It takes uh, recruitment and selection unlike we've ever seen. Um, we all know that all these organizations name the organization from Ranger Regiment to uh, the the higher echelon uh, detach you know, special organizations within the police forces they're made up of people that that are older uh who've undergone more training who've demonstrated f efficiencies in decision making um who've been put under stress and, and that's the, i'm speaking to the choir here 
but the the whole evolution of army combatives is about putting you under stress and i want to see how you function how can i do that safely police and military they do that differently so the biggest thing we can do to prepare for war in the future which will be more urban more decentralized and in this in this state of constant information warfare where every action and every soldier is judged just like it is on the police force you have to create more highly specialized individuals i believe you should you know, we all need a rotational force right so I, I, and most people understand how much the u.s military i know it's not like this for the well it is like that for some police forces but how rotational our militaries are right the marine corps is made up of 80 percent of people that are only in the military for four years so it's it's it, it's a very young organization all the time. So that create that creates challenges in developing more and more specialization or a more professional, more warriors. So I if especially if I was in the military or the army, I would I would make positions longer. I would require demonstration of skills. So even in our non-commissioned officers and in our officers, why why the hell do we rotate everybody? all the time um so where you're literally on the job training we don't do this in our police but you're literally on the job training in the military most of the time you, it, it's not like that in necessarily all you but especially for the officers like you do two years here you're moving on you, you're literally it's just blows the mind in in human performance that how long it takes to become a master of something we have to create more highly specialized organizations that have the ability and trust like we were talking about earlier to to break up into these de de decentralized elements and they not ruin the the fight for us because they're always being judged same thing for the police force and i i interviewed the police chief here for my podcast show and the challenges of getting recruits that they then how long they can keep them in training before they got to get them on patrol how long that they're on patrol before they're you know, left seat, right seat, right, or the different terms for it. Now they're on their own. Uh, there is a way to do it. And necessarily, that, it might create more funding, not less funding. Don't get me started on defund talk conversations that are so stupid. Um, in the military, it's about priorities, where you have a seven hundred billion dollar budget, and you, but you're still holding on to ancient personnel management systems that worked in world war ii that you had to rotate people every year or two um so you're invested in ai and robotics but still think the dumb private is going to be the one operating that not dumb private i miss the young private mm -hmm. uh, who, who doesn't have the training uh, who hasn't been put under stress cognitively slip <laughs> yeah a little sporty slip i mean i was a dumb private i, I, I got i mean i got my ear bit off because <laughs> I was I was a dummy and, and mounted somebody and, and didn't have control of their face. Uh, but the belief that we're going to keep evolving weapons and technologies and we don't need to change the, the way we treat people. And that that belief that, you know, training somebody longer is just something nice to do. And when we but when we get under pressure as a as a culture, as a institution, as a either a military or a police force, We'll actually speed that training and get people that uh, we have to create better warriors. Yeah, and and that that speed of because we're we're trying to essentially appease the demand of of the of the clients or the customers, which are the American people or the or the local populace, whatever it call. I mean, we're we're trying to appease them, but at the same time, we're actually doing long-term damage because as you said it's those guys that are qu quickly trained and they're rushed through this process those are the guys who are making these these strategic uh strategic issues or are creating these strategic problems where you have a, a cop in in minnesota and his actions are affecting the cop in arkansas because of they just see this this one concept in the same way if a marine does something in iraq it affects a soldier in afghanistan because it's they just see one uniformed force um one of the, so let, let's uh how do how do people get a hold of you i i think uh you know how do how do we get people more informed with modern war and trying to learn this material because i i think it's as you said it, it's it's 
transcending the institution. And I think the American people have to get more involved and they got to get more um, informed on this and they got to do it properly. So uh, you're not limited by the constraints of the institution anymore. So yeah. let's uh, let, how do we get people to you that and, and uh, get, get them learn? Yeah. So I, I, uh, which my wife hates, but I'm, I'm a big social media person um, as, cause I think this is a battle of ideas. So you can find me on Twitter at, um, at Spencer guard. Um, that's probably the biggest way. Um, through the institution though, that I work for the modern war Institute, we have a website that publishes an article, a podcast or a video every day, Monday through Friday. Um, and that was really our, our big mission. So going to that organization and staying current with what's going on in the world or the, the, the debate. And it's something I didn't learn in 20 years of military experience. I, I'll tell you, I did not work on that element of my warrior skill set of scholarship, reading, writing, even looking at the past. I just didn't do it. I was too busy doing. Um, and I think that's a big thing, but you know, social media is the biggest place to get a hold of me. And then through the modern wars to also is, is another way. So, I mean, Guys, if you're, you're wearing a uniform, uh, even if you're not, even if you're just concerned for the country and you, you want to be prepared for, you know, know what to do, where your tax dollars are going, you know, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Uh, guys, I, I, I highly suggest, man, I, I can't recommend it enough. I mean, anything you say from having to a podcast, I'm just it's just going to be undersold. I mean, there's valuable information coming from the Modern War Institute. So please go check them out and make sure you guys are subscribed to the uh, Spotter.